Okay, so good morning everybody. My name is Michael Carrion. I'm from the British Council in London. I'm head of the English language programs for British Council Worldwide. And um, I'm honored to be here today speaking with my TERF colleagues, and especially as a way of uh, helping to support the fantastic work that TERF has been doing in developing research and re uh, supporting research papers around the different areas of English language teaching. And in particular, our uh, focus of today is around the, uh, the report, which I'm sure you've already read, which is the impact of English and plurilingualism on global cooperation. If you haven't read this already, please go to the turfonline.org website, download that, and you'll find it very helpful. And what I wanted to do, following up from my colleagues, was to take a slightly different angle to look at the, the interaction of English and plurilingualism, um, taking some thoughts from the turf reports, and also trying to see where we might go with future research, because the secret, of course, is to get much more research in these areas that uh, impact our teaching and learning worldwide. And, and my thought is around the plurilingual or the multilingual aspect. Um, Ralph Waldo Emerson says it always very eloquently. If we are now entering a, an era of globalization, global citizenship, we have to focus on making everybody multilingual or plurilingual. We have to focus, um, as some of these uh, very important English teachers over here on the screen have suggested, on making sure that we don't divorce language from the culture that people have in their hearts and their souls and in their day-to-day -day, uh, lives around the world. Um, English is now unquestionably the global language, but there is a danger that if we just accept that, uh, and don't think about the implications of it, that we may cause negative reactions in other parts of the world. Multilingualism is an important thing for everybody, and not only for those who are learning English as their second or third language. It, multilingualism is part of being a global citizen, part of being a human. We've always been, as David Christen says, we've always been multilingual. It's the natural status of human beings to be multilingual. Tend to forget that. 2,000 years ago, everybody spoke Latin as a global language, but they also spoke their own, <coughs> own languages. Incidentally, I always wonder how teaching Latin as a foreign language was so successful <laughs> 2,000 years ago when we didn't have communicative teaching, we didn't have interactive whiteboards. How did they do it? Very interesting. We should learn that. Um, but we need to focus on the broader language issues in the world as well as, as Reese points out, helping people globally to gain proficiency for their um, economic and personal development. Uh, by teaching English, we are, ipso facto, making people in the world multilingual. At British Council, we've thought about that quite a lot because we, we teach around 400,000 uh, students each year face-to-face. -face. And on our websites uh, for learners, we, we reach about 25 million learners a year. Um, so we're having an impact on their lives, we hope, certainly we're helping them with English. We're making them multilingual. But are we taking from that a consequence that we as English speakers also need to be multilingual? That if we live in a global world, we live in a multilingual world, what does that mean for English speakers and English teachers as well as the people who are learning English and teaching English? And there are lots of language issues in the world, we don't have time to go into them now, but we need to focus on what language means for people's identity and their cultural life. Um, I live in London, which is one of the most um, multilingual cities on the planet. We have over 300 languages spoken in London. There's 270 separate languages spoken in the school system of the city in London. 270. Um, and increasingly, people are multilingual in, in their normal everyday lives, not just in something they do for work. People marry across language boundaries, people come from around the world and live in an English-speaking country. And as these little comments show, fantastic book here by David, David Block, by the way, on what multilingual identity <coughs> means to people. Uh, people feel that their identity is bound up with being a multilingual person, and they feel different in uh, speaking Spanish or English, or speaking Japanese or English, or speaking French or English. These are realities that we need to focus on when we're focusing on teaching English because these are the impacts that we are having and we need to be 
sensitive to that. Um, in the UK, we're very sensitive to that because we are, although most people don't realize that, a multilingual country. We have six indigenous languages in the UK. Uh, Welsh, Scottish Gaelic, Irish Gaelic, Manx, Cornish, and some people will uh, argue about Scots as well, but let's not get into that.
Brazil to seek and revive <coughs> to find out what we need to learn from the impact of this global language that we are giving to the world, sharing with the world, because it has upsides, downsides, and side sides that we need to understand better. One of the case studies will be Rwanda, which is probably the most fascinating language learning country on the planet at the moment because they're in the process of switching from having French as an official language to English as an official language, and that's not an easy thing to do. Um, the, key, the key research that TERF has done, uh, which my colleagues have just referred to and quoted from, uh, is, is uh, one step in this direction. We need to find new areas of research that push this forward. As English teachers, I think that we also have a role in this. We, we must accept our responsibility, if you like, if that's the right word, to, to, to understand that we are making people multilingual. <coughs> what does that mean for us and for our own uh, English-speaking countries and cultures? I think we should teach more about language itself, language concepts. What does language mean? Not just English, not just the past tense and the going to uh, future, but the concepts of language, how people communicate, where, where languages um, interact with each, with each other, and concepts such as diglossia, code switching, um, world Englishes, things like English, which are a mixture of um, English with Hindi, very popular in India, things like Surgic. Surgic is a, a, I don't know if you know Surgic, I'm trying to learn it at the moment. It's a, it's a socio-political response to a politico-linguistic problem in Ukraine and Russia. Uh, Ukraine and Russia have, speak different languages. Russian and Ukraine are quite similar, but they are different. Ukraine has 50% of the population that speaks Russian and 50% that speak Ukrainian, but Ukrainian has been imposed, for national reasons, as the language of the country. Half the country don't speak it. So what happens? They mix the two languages together. Everybody speaks Sergic, which is Russian and Ukrainian mixed together with the words. You pick up whichever word you feel would be most appropriate and the one you remember. Uh, it's very interesting. Languages are flexible. The, 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 the human capacity for language is flexible, we need to make sure that our learners understand this, so that language is just a, uh, a one-stop area. It's not just about learning English, it's about learning how to communicate, learning how to respect other cultures, uh, learning how to help other people um, maintain their own language. Um, in Europe, for example, huge amounts of investment by the European Union is going into making sure that languages like Bulgarian, Latvian, and Czech don't die out. Sort of uh, overburdened, as it were, by the level of English. So there's a lot for us to learn.